The Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples, oops, all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife, Sarah, his nephew, Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. I had. Uh, this is the first uh, of three weeks that are going to be leading up to our annual fundraiser. This is what used to be Wine to Water. So show of hands if you've been involved in Wine to Water for the last five years at all. Cool, so just like half of us. So, uh, so this will be like brand new, and then for some of you, this will be kind of a change. Um, wine to water, the last five years, what we've done is sort of uh, talk about the connections between uh, water as a metaphor for spirituality for three or four weeks, and then we do this big fundraiser. And I think we've now, over five years, drilled 23 wells in Cambodia. Um, so we do sort of this annual emphasis on this. We decided this year to take a break from Wine to Water and do something more local, uh, sort of a more direct connection, but with the same idea. We want to raise awareness, and then we also want to raise some money for a cause. Um, I'll tell you more about what it is in just a minute. Uh, but a bit of a lead-in from tonight's uh, text, there's sort of this weird paradox as you read through this text. And I've heard this story a bunch, you probably recognize it, because I think we've actually done this text in different ways and sort of pulled different pieces from it over the last year. There's this paradox where you've got a family departure. Abram leaves his father's house. You've got sort of the formation of a new family or like this new tribe. So uh, he already in some sense still has a family, um, but then he's sort of leaving a family, creating a family that sort of transcends and includes his existing family. So it's weird. He leaves a family, he brings a family, he creates a new family. Um, and uh, in his most recent book, what is the Bible, Rob Bell has this great section on this, this text and basically says the core of the story that creates kind of the understanding of who Israel is, their identity, which then creates the understanding of what Christianity becomes, is, nope, uh, where did, tribe for, other, there we go, tribe for all the other tribes. Um, and so the, the idea being that in the face of the context, which at that time was tribal warfare, you had your tribe, and in order for your tribe to survive and get the land that it needed, the resources that it needed, with the understanding that there was scarcity, there was only enough for some of the tribes, the tribes would fight each other. And because of that, their gods were understood to be against each other. So if your tribe went to war with another tribe, whoever won, their god had given them the victory. So this was sort of an era of tribal warfare. The tribes were at... Uh, at war with each other. So in the face of that, Abram not only leaves his tribe, which was also brand new. Um, people didn't do that. You stayed with your tribe. You stayed in your father's house, that kind of thing. Uh, but he also was supposed to found a tribe that was, instead of being against all the other tribes, was somehow supposed to be for these other tribes. Brian McLaren says it like this, no longer us and them, but now some of us, this new tribe, for all of us. Uh, and again, we've, we've done this in some form or fashion, uh, this passage over the, over the last year, but if you follow the story a little further, it goes on, and it takes this idea of the tribe for other tribes even further. Uh, not just a tribe for other tribes, but it also, in many ways, becomes a tribe for those without a tribe. Uh, and we see this in some very specific ways um, over the rest of the, the Hebrew scriptures. The tribe for those without a tribe, specifically related to strangers, to travelers, to widows, and for the sake of what we're going to be doing this month, orphans. Uh, and so I'll just give you a, a little snippet. Um, in the, this is in Exodus. You shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. If you do mistreat them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry and my wrath will burn and I will kill you with the sword. God has a sword. And your wives shall become widows and your children fatherless. So whatever you think about God, killing people, uh, set to one side. The point is, it's not good to mistreat orphans and widows. Uh, we don't have time to get into that. Isaiah, um, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless. So again, the orphan, plead the widow's cause. Psalmist, give justice to the weak and the fatherless, maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute in the book of Job, because I delivered the poor who cried for help and the fatherless who had no one to help them. So God is saying the fatherless are those who have no help. 
God is the one who comes to their aid to help them. Again, the psalmist, the Lord watches over the sojourners, that's the traveler. He upholds the widow and the fatherless, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. So again, whatever you think about God bringing things to ruin, the point is wickedness is associated with mistreating uh, the, the fatherless or the widow. So um, just to, to pick, oh, and then James, my favorite. <laughs> Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. This is just a few uh, that I picked that I think are the most powerful and maybe direct, but there are like 30 more um, in the Hebrew scriptures that call for the same care and hospitality and justice for the orphan. The point being, this is not an afterthought uh, in the text that gives shape to who Jesus is, that gives shape to what Christianity is. Uh, this is the core identity of, of our faith, of our practice, and, and what becomes our faith tradition. So if you didn't notice this sort of subtle shift from Abraham, tribe for other tribes, and then sort of this, this ethic of care for the orphan, the, the tribe for other tribes shifts kind of to what we might consider family language and addresses those without the support of a family. Kids without a family, wives without a husband, uh, which in the ancient world would have been two of the most vulnerable uh, people groups because of that, often excluded from their tribe because of their lack of family. Um, they would have no status, little or no status, resource, rights, or often support. Uh, so in some sense, and, and I want to say not in every case, so don't take this corollary too far, but for the sake of simplicity, and I think for the sake of what we're trying to understand, we might even sort of swap out the word family for tribe or tribe for family and start to think of this in terms of what does it mean to create family for those without a family or more than blood. And we've sort of talked about this in many ways. I know for at least the last two and a half or three years, um, the idea of an altruism that extends beyond our blood family and even an altruism that extends beyond our tribe. And I know it was probably a year and a half ago, I think it was during the first John series, uh, where we had sort of the video and there's a guy who's drunk on railroad tracks and one of the railroad workers like runs and dives in front to like knock the guy off the railroad tracks. And we kind of went, what? possesses someone to do that. Like, that's not that guy's family. And like, they're probably not even in the same tribe. They don't go to the same church. This guy like threw himself in front of a train to save this other guy. So this idea that there is, uh, in some sense, a self-giving love, an altruism that extends beyond our blood family. Um, and then you've got Jesus who does crazy stuff in the gospels. Uh, like when, when uh, his disciples come and they say, hey, your, your mother and your brothers are outside. And he goes, who are my mother and my brothers? Um, and then he sort of points to the people around him. He goes, oh, it's, it's the people who follow me, who do my father's will. Um, or even when Jesus is on the cross and like his mom and one of his, his favorite guys is there and he's like, hey, this is your son. Um, so he has this very fluid understanding or very transcendent understanding of what family is and who and how people are included in the understanding of family. So between the ethic uh, for the orphan and the widow, this clear sense we get from Jesus, that fidelity to this way of being human and human relationships and human community, this tribe for others transcends and excludes uh, explicitly blood family or legal family, and it makes a tribe and a family a function of our practice of inclusion, our practice of belonging, our practice of, of what we might call essential hospitality in the world. Side note about this text, um, and there's a few things that we don't want to spend a lot of time, but I did, <laughs> I want to take time to do this because I don't think I've ever done this in relationship to this text, and I think we have to be careful because uh, we don't want to so celebrate this text that we miss out on the fact that it's really good, but it's not perfect. <laughs> um, it's very progressive, but it's not perfect. Uh, so right after what we read, they get to the land of Canaan, pronounced perfectly, um, and it says something to the effect of like, the people were there. There were already people there. Um, there were natives there, so to speak. Uh, and God supposedly says, you can have this land. Or like, I will give you this land. Um, and there's, there's subtext there about the fact that because this is a tribal warfare culture, they end up conquering and kicking these people out, in many cases killing or expelling. Uh, and the point that I want to make is um, that it's okay for us to have this ideal, tribe for other tribes, family for those without families, um, but also to acknowledge that we practice that imperfectly, that we often hurt others on our way to finding family, on our way to making and extending family to others without families, uh, 
Which again is why things like forgiveness and grace and mercy are so important in the practice of our faith. Not just the things we believe, but in how we practice this because we don't do it perfectly. Um, We mean well, but we still hurt people. Um, And so we need to have ways to address that, to admit that we hurt people on our way even to good things. Uh, And I think when I I read the text a lot this week, and I kept, at the end of it, I kept going, just because we do it in the name of God doesn't make it divine or Christian or even acceptable. Um, Kicking people out of their land, kicking people out of a tribe, expelling people from family uh, is not okay. Um, It's not acceptable. So just side note, um, because again, the text is good, but it's not perfect. So What I want to do tonight, just to kind of set this up, and then we're going to actually get better information straight from the source, uh, is just to sort of present an understanding of what is the problem that we're addressing, right? If we're sort of doing uh, this month of of emphasis um, and then sort of trying to raise money for a local cause, what's the problem? And then what is the call that we hear from our tradition, from our practice of faith? And that could be from the, the Christian tradition or just your involvement in this community. So what's the problem and what's the call? The problem is this. Uh, There are kids without families or homes. Um, To put it very simply, uh, that could be because of neglect, because they've got unfit parents, because these kids are unsafe or harmed or abused, or just by some accident that the parents uh, have been killed in an accident for whatever reason. um, And we'll hear a lot of different stories and understand a lot of different nuance involved in how this happens. But still in the world today, there are kids without families or without homes. That's a problem. That needs to be addressed. Um, This is going to be our focus. This is going to be the cause that we put our effort and our energy into this month. Um, We're going to get educated about it. We're going to figure out how we can be involved in it. Uh, And then at the fundraiser, we are going to have the opportunity to invest in addressing this problem. And then the call is what I've essentially termed essential hospitality. Um, Essentially, I got that. I doubled up. Dang it. See, good but not perfect. Uh, So... Just to sort of think through what we just heard from these texts, in the Exodus reading, um, mistreating or taking advantage of orphans is called wicked. So start very simply, don't do that. Um, (laughs) If you have the opportunity to mistreat or take advantage of an orphan, don't. Um, That's a simple black and white thing. If you can, don't. You shouldn't. Um, Isaiah says we have to learn to do good, to seek justice for the orphan. Um, I love this. Anytime the scriptures talk about learning or growing or maturing, uh, I feel like it's one of the healthiest things for us to spend a lot of time focused on that because very often I think we understand religion to be binary, Um, like we didn't know something and then somebody told us and then we knew something and then we were done Um, (laughs) because then we could just believe it or know it. Uh, The idea being, if we have to learn to seek justice and learn to do good to the orphan, the idea is that might not come naturally to us Um, and we don't have to just learn about it. We have to actually learn how to do the work uh, of seeking justice and doing good to the orphan. The Job reading was pretty straightforward. Uh, If you hear the cry of the orphan, help them. So maybe the first step to that is listening for the cry, and then if you hear it, do something about it. That's part of what we'll do is both practice listening to the cry of those without families or homes. James, also very direct, whatever you think you believe about your religion, your spirituality, blah, 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 it's rubbish unless you care for the orphan. Um, It's not a system of beliefs, it's a way of life. So uh, talk is cheap, hypocrisy is real. (laughs) Um, And I love this, you don't need a God in the clouds to judge you um, for mistreating orphans. You don't need a clergy person to guilt you. Uh, This is the thing that sucks about hypocrisy is we're usually the first people that know. (laughs) Um, But we're also the best at pushing it down. Um, So part of what we can do is also listen to our hypocrisy. Um, And I wanna just guide us through thinking through beginning to shape how it is that we listen uh, for this problem and how it is we listen to the call to address this problem. So let's start very broad. Do you know someone? I want to ask it as a question. You know someone from another tribe. You do. You know someone from another tribe. They've got a different religion than you or maybe different theology or ideology. Um, this, will be less, this will be less common because it's a very weird thing in our world. Maybe somebody politically different than you. Tough crowd, wow, that got not a laugh, nothing. Hold on. Somebody politically different than you. Thank you, right. You know what, I'm done, you guys. Um, and this, so this could, be, this could be incredibly uncomfortable like that, right, politics, but also maybe just like a sports team. You know, you're a Gator and someone else is Seminole or whatever. I don't like basketball anyway. Um, 
You like the classics, they like pop music, whatever it is. You know people, you do know people from different tribes. Um, What would it look like for you to initiate showing that person love, to bless that person? Um, Or if we're supposed to be a part of a tribe that's for all the other tribes, even the ones who are different from us, uh, what does it mean for you to be for that person? Um, I don't know, but I'm inviting you to think through that. Then do you know someone who has, and maybe this is less common, do you know someone that has no tribe at all? Uh, We might consider these people like a loner or a misfit, uh, somebody on the margins, um, someone who either because of what they've gone through has chosen to move to the margins or someone who because of their circumstances has been pushed by society or tribes or culture to the margins, how can you show that person love? If you know someone like that, how can you show them love? How can you offer them welcome? How can you extend to them hospitality? Uh, One of the simplest ways I've ever encountered uh, is to learn their name and call them by it. Um, This is one of the most humanizing practices that you can do with a person. I think my dad taught me this when I was in like third grade. He's like, if you want to understand sales, learn someone's name and call them that name. It's the most important word in the English language to that person. Learn their name and say it. And he does that in restaurants. What's Flo? Yes, Flo, I would love a short stack of pancakes. Like, and then he'll say their name over and it's almost like embarrassing. But he takes it really seriously. Like learn someone's name and call them by their name. It's incredibly humanizing because it means it's not just uh, machinery that's serving a function for you in your life that you're seeing them and making them a person. So how else could you humanize them? That's something you could think through. Um, How else can you uh, create a situation where you can help to see that person? And this is all the way up and down. I mean, we've got the the students with us. Is there somebody who sits alone at lunch? Can you sit with that person at lunch? Can you invite them into a conversation? Can you ask an open-ended question that doesn't uh, generate a debate or a fight or anything like that, but just something that invites them to interact as a person? Um, Could you invite them into any number of tribes that you're a part of? Uh, If there's somebody without a tribe, how could you include them in one of the tribes that you're a part of? And Do you know someone, and especially as we think through this in relation to to orphans, to children with no family or no home, um, do you know someone with no family? I think my... Some of my initial engagement with this um, was growing up down the street from a family with special needs. Um, and this family had a crazy situation. But the husband had served in Vietnam, was exposed to Agent Orange, and so they had had three kids in a row with severe disabilities. Um, and then they adopted, and the kid they adopted was a child prodigy, um, just like the most brilliant kid. But growing up down the street from them and interacting not just with their family, but the families that they were connected with through like the special schools and stuff they went to, it was amazing how often we would connect with kids uh, that we learned at a very early age didn't have the same exposure to family that we had, didn't get the same support from family that we had. Uh, But then even going to like college, very often people who have no family, that can be geographical, that can be seasonal. Uh, It it can be literal, and I think one of the coolest things I've seen often is some of my young professional friends who graduate from college, they go get work somewhere else. Intermission has been brought to you by that guy on a motorcycle. (laughs) Um, This, the, the whole like Friendsgiving thing, where people are away from their families. They're not home at Thanksgiving, they don't have family in like that nuclear setting, but they create family for themselves. And it's been neat to see how often uh, and you guys know how this is, and it's very often it sucks, right? There are, uh, there are people who might not get, uh, maybe they don't have family, they might not get invited to hang out on a regular basis, and what I've seen over and over and over is that something about the generous spirit of that event, that I've seen people get invited to a Friendsgiving, and I sort of see the pictures and I go, how in the world did that group of people end up together? Um, it's incredibly generous, the way people are able to fold in uh, people who have no tribe or no family. Um, and then how, so what does it mean for you? How do you extend that family? How do you show hospitality? Uh, and then do you know anyone who's lost their family or, or been abused or neglected, rejected, especially a child, especially an orphan? Um, 
what does it look like for you, for us as a community, to begin to invite them to belong without condition, to extend grace and love and hope? Uh, and I have a friend, and I think this is, makes me sick because I think this is far too common. Uh, I have a friend who, who grew up in a very religious uh, family. Um, father was a, was a preacher, many sisters and brothers. And uh, for a while, she dated one of my best friends. And then after coming out, um, came out to like people she could trust uh, and was out for a number of years. But when she came out to her family, was totally rejected, cut off, still to this day, entirely excommunicated from family, um, even her brothers and sisters. Uh, and this is much more common um, than, than we would like to think. And that's true of people who are a part of, of this congregation, a part of this community, whether for sexuality or gender identity, for religious or theological reasons or changes. Uh, people are abused, and that is abuse. They're rejected from families. They're excluded from their blood relationships. Uh, so what does it look like for us, if we're calling this congregation a school of love, what does it look like for us to be a tribe for other tribes, but also for the tribeless, to be family for those without family? Um, good questions. I hope that we can address some of these. I don't think we're going to answer all these, but I hope that we can address these, and these can inspire us over the next few weeks. Um, but I also want to invite us to take a deep breath uh, and, and pause and be wise. Because <laughs> um, we've presented this problem, but we also need to stop and think about what we need to know in order to do this well. Um, who we can connect with so that we don't just reinvent the wheel. Um, and then how we can sort of strategically and wisely do best uh, the job that we can do after hearing this call to address this. Let's not all just run out and invite a stranger to come and live with us. <laughs> Let's not all just run out and, and adopt or foster a kid. And maybe that's where you land. That may be. But it is wise to begin with some education, um, with some wisdom and discernment. Um, there's this great parable uh, about a guy who's, who's backpacking through Ireland, and uh, he gets lost, um, and he knows where he wants to go, but he doesn't have any idea where he is. Um, and he's wandering for like six, seven hours in the middle of the day in the hills of Ireland. And finally, um, no trails, nothing, but a Jeep is sort of like bumbling through the hills. And he's like waves and waves a shirt. And finally, the Jeep comes over. Uh, the guy rolls down his window and he goes, oh, yeah, I'm really lost. Um, I, don't have any, I haven't had any idea where I am for like the last six or seven hours. I'm probably going in the wrong direction. The guy goes, oh, that's, that's fine. I can give you a ride if you want or I'll just point you in the right direction. He goes, okay, you know, that'd be great. I'm trying to get to Tipperary. And the guy goes, oh, yeah, Tipperary. You know, that, that's not that hard. The only thing is, I wouldn't start here. <laughs> um, we ha and very often, we hear a problem that's overwhelming, um, and our initial thought is, we, we don't want to start where we are, but we have to start where we are. Um, that this is the only place we can start. So this month, we want to start by understanding um, what is already being done by a part of our tribe, part of the larger tribe, the United Methodist Church, if you didn't know we were affiliated. Surprise. Um, the United Methodist Church is already doing about uh, kids without families or without homes. Um, so we want to understand that. We want to ask questions about how it is that we can be involved individually and as a congregation. Again, not to reinvent the wheel, but involve ourselves and invest ourselves in what is already working. Um, Clarence, can you throw that slide up, the benefit slide? So um, the event that will be at the end of the month is going to be a benefit for the United Methodist Children's Home pretty straightforward. There wasn't a good um, alliteration, like wine to water. Uh, and we thought about wine for orphans, but that didn't seem appropriate. So, um, <laughs> and we're not entirely sure if we're going to have a wine tasting event either. So we're still putting the event together. But whatever it is, that last Sunday of the month, we're going to host a, a benefit, a fundraiser uh, for the United Methodist Children's Home. So um, you should be involved in that. And again, the, the focus of the entire month is going to be educate, invest, and involve. Right? So how can we understand this better? How can we each individually and as a congregation be involved in addressing this? Uh, and then if we're able to, how can we raise money to support what the children's home is already doing? Uh, because they are acutely aware of the problem and the call to address it with good work, with seeking justice, with forming tribes for kids and families beyond blood 
And most importantly, it is working. The things that they're doing, it's already working. So it's not on us to figure this out, but instead to figure out how we can pour fuel in the fire of what's already working. How can we be more directly involved? So um, in a second, I'm going to invite Madeline Lazinski and Ryan Frack uh, from the Children's Home Up to give us a quick intro. Um, I'm going to sort of interview them. We'll talk a little bit about uh, the problem in the call, and then we're actually going to collect questions from you all that we can address and sort of shape what we learn and, and how you guys hear from them in the next few weeks. Um, and I already said to, to Madeline and Ryan, I'm going to encourage them not to use their best stuff tonight because Madeline's preaching next week and then Ryan is going to do the following week, help us during the Intergen night for kids to understand um, how it is that, that we're involved in this stuff. So um, check out this video. Did we get the video pulled in? Awesome. See, Clarence is so good. Such an operator. Yeah, hand for Clarence. It's not like this stuff is just on YouTube. It's literally on YouTube. Um, but uh, so, so Madeline and Ryan, why don't you guys come on up um, and you guys check out this intro video real quick. You guys can sit there. The children's home has been here since 1908 and it was originally formed as an orphanage as many institutions were at that time. But over the years, things have changed a lot and we now have to look at the changing needs of our residents. For those children who have been removed, and most of our children are here because somebody hurt them. They're not here because they're bad. They're here because someplace along the line, an adult was unable to take care of them. So our hope is to be able to provide a certain level of intense care that will help these kids rehabilitate and either get back home or get into the community in some type of a permanent level. So in, in that sense, we serve approximately 70 to 80 children at a time. We provide them intensive services and hopefully can rehabilitate them and put them back into the community. So hopefully that's what we, we do here. The Children's Home is very successful. I have worked in many different group homes in several different states. And there are two things that set Florida United Methodist Children's Home apart. Number one is that we are mission driven. And everyone who is here is here for a mission. So we're all here to do the same thing. We're all unified. We're, we're people who know why we're here and we know what we're doing. But the second very important thing is that we are a trauma-informed agency. And what that means is that everybody who works here, from the guy who cuts the grass to the CEO, knows that if a kid is out there breaking a window or screaming or crying, it's not because they're bad. It's because somebody hurt them and they're reacting to that. Uh, so meet my good friends. This is the Reverend Madeline Lazinski. Yes. All right. <laughs> she did it to me the other day. So. Yeah. Um, so Madeline Lazinski and Ryan Frack. And Madeline is the chaplain at the United Methodist Children's Home. So if you didn't know, this is an enterprise, which is like 20 minutes away, not even 15. Um, the last exit before the lake. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then Ryan does church relations, also the reverend? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Rocks up. We have, a, there's so much young clergy over here. <laughs> so Power much house. reverence. Yeah, so much reverence. <laughs> Am I sitting in front of the speaker and making it bad? Okay. So good. And you didn't trip on that, which was the most professional. It was a recovery. <laughs> um, yes, look at that. Oh, there we go. <laughs> titles and everything. Um, so in the video, she referenced the mission, um, mission driven. Everybody knows what the mission is. In your own words, what's, what's the mission? Um, I actually had it memorized at one point. Um, <laughs> well, good. I'm glad you forgot it. There's some Just paraphrasing. In we're, we're actually <laughs> in the process of rewriting it. So in, oh, inevitably, it's about empowering children and families um, to experience uh, wholeness through, as modeled through Christ. Um, and so our ambition when kids come into our care, and as you'll learn as we talk more about what we do, it's not just youth that come into our care, but we interact with families as a whole unit. If, if children have been removed from their families, if that, the goal is reunification, we work with the entire family as a unit, but also with foster families as they're creating new tribes. Um, and so we work with families and children, and we want to empower them and to create tribes and to create wholeness um, spiritually physically, all the ways, emotionally, as they um, seek to become a family together and seek to become people who are whole and aware of their goodness as made by God. So, 
Awesome. Anything to add to that, Ryan? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, you hit most of it, or all of it. Um, from, I mean, in my own words, I think it's just providing a safe space um, from a holistic approach. Cool. Awesome. So in the, um, in the framework of like the problem in the call, um, what, so just sort of articulate for a moment um, what the problem is, or maybe what the problem looks like and feels like now. I put it really simply, just there are kids without families or kids without homes. Um, how are you guys most directly exposed to that, or what does it feel like in your interaction with the children's home? I think the word that gets thrown around a lot um, that probably most accurately describes it and covers the whole um, gamut of things kids have gone through has been trauma. So just there's been hurt at some level, whether it's um, hurt that has led to uh, the state getting involved or just uh, hurt in terms of broken trust, abandonment, uh, drug issues, things like that. And so um, I, think, I don't think there's somebody you've interacted with that hasn't had some level of trauma. Yeah. 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 OK. Anything to add to that? Mm, I'll stick with trauma. That's a good word okay. for it. Yeah, I had, and that was new to me. Like I like, and we talked a lot about this, but until I watched that video, I was like a trauma-informed agency. I hadn't heard that language, and I was like, that makes that makes a ton of sense. That helps to understand a little more what it is that we're trying to kind of get in, involved in and address. Um, so, in terms of the call, um, this is not just like a well-intentioned non-for-profit uh, agency. It's connected to the United Methodist Church. So, in terms of sort of the the call that I just very briefly articulated to care for this. Uh, specific group, how does that shape the way you guys do your work or the way you understand that call in like the nuts and bolts of the organization? Um, what does that look like or feel like? So um, I really love that you use the word uh, essential hospitality Yeah. Um, because this isn't necessarily always a matter of life and death, but it's a, a matter of making it or not making it um, in a lot of ways with these kids is that without this type of hospitality without the environment that the children's home provides or other agencies like ourselves or the communities that end up rallying around these children and youth, like they're not gonna make it. They end up homeless, they end up, actually sometimes it becomes a matter of life and death, they yeah. end up in jail. Um, so life doesn't look um, very, it doesn't flourish. Yeah. when there isn't this type of hospitality. Um, and so we know that with our kids when they come in. Um, we know that this is essential and that um, a lot of times our youth come in and they're very angry and they're upset, as you could imagine, particularly if they, this is their first time being removed from their families, um, what that would experience would be like as a person under the age of 17. Um, and then you see the transformation of Understand, their understanding of what hospitality and family is supposed to look like and their understanding of what healthy relationships look like. Healthy relationships is another buzzword on our campus or phrase um, because in all that we do, we seek to model and provide healthy relationships for people who have not experienced that or don't know what that really means and really looks like. Um, and so that's what we strive to do every day with our essential of hospitality at the home. That's really powerful. That, I think a lot of that probably makes sense, especially to some of the, the core of this community, because it's not as if you're encountering uh, a blank slate, who right. you then get to go, oh, this is what healthy relationships look like. Instead, it's, it's like a, I think a lot of the people with trauma related to their religious past or experiences with other churches um, or like really toxic theology is mm -hmm. that you have to start by deconstructing some of the really misunderstanding, right. uh, sort of uh, destructive messages and models and going, hey, this is, that's not healthy, that's not whole, now let's start to build an understanding of what works and what is healthy. That's good. Anything, Ryan, to add to that? It's more so, I mean, personally, um, I'm really proud to be a part of an organization that um, emphasizes the trauma-informed care. Yeah. Uh, I've got a background in social work um, as well, and uh, one of the things that got me um, interested in ministry was uh, frankly seeing uh, pastoral care done really poorly. I believe in the power of prayer, um, but there are some really dangerous and destructive ways to respond to some abusive situations that, um, you know, I think from our tradition in the United Methodist Church, taking uh, not only our knowledge of God, but putting that to action through uh, evidence-based practices and things like that. I'm really proud of an organization that balances both of those components yeah. well. Um, so that not only can we 
you know, when, when Madeline speaks to the kids, uh, it's not just staying up here, it's also here's something that you can do or here are yeah. some steps that we can put in place um, so that it's, um, it doesn't stay there that day, but it's a long-term um, rebuilding of those um, unhealthy, yeah. um, it's really they're breaking cycles. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm really proud to be a part of that. That's awesome. Yeah, not just beliefs, but modeling and practicing different ways of, of living. That's huge. Um, cool. How, uh, let's take a few minutes. Is there anything that you guys feel like you're really curious about or you want to know that we can learn from Madeline and Ryan in the next few weeks as we get ready to, to kind of become more involved? Um, we are going to try and schedule at least one, but maybe a couple opportunities to actually go and take a tour of the children's home um, at some point in the next month. So. Uh, if you're interested in that, it's it's amazing. It's a huge campus. It's close enough that you can get down there and do a tour, and it'll only be a couple hours of your time. But um, I've gotten to get down there a couple times this last year, and it's it's really, really cool to see what all they're doing. Um, but what are you guys curious about, or what would you like sort of answered or more information on? Bill? Trauma of man's wounds. How do you heal wounds? How do you heal wounds? Ooh. How do you heal the kids? How do we heal them? Yeah. So, uh, you can also say into treatment plans, um, but uh, both when we talk about our holistic care, that's what I hear you asking about. So trauma, we recognize that our kids are in our care um, usually an average of like 18 months. So we know that they they will not fully be healed from their trauma in that time. Trauma, we as we know, carries throughout our life, and it's more learning how to cope with it and how to um, just wrestle with that as we go on and seek to become healthy. Um, but in that, we have kind of all of these different departments and brackets that rally around the kids. They have um, house parents who live with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis and are constantly pouring into them as like a parent parental figures would. We have therapists that meet with them once a week um, individually and then once a week as a whole cottage household together. And so they're getting um, therapy that way. Spiritual life, we have, you know, church and youth group and other opportunities for pastoral care. And my preaching and my programming in the chapel looks very different than you might see in an average church or youth group. It also looks a lot the same. We play games, we have messages, we do all the same things that youth group kids do. But what we talk about and I, what I love is that in a way we kind of cut the surface level stuff because we don't have to sit at that level with these kids because they've already experienced some of the deepest and darkest things of life. And so we can have a conversation that digs deeper um, right away without having to kind of st stay up here. And so we talk about a lot of hard things that maybe the average youth group struggles to get to. Um, and so we always are, t are speaking at a trauma-informed level. And I can speak most obviously from the spiritual life perspective because kids are harmed spiritually as well. And that's something that I'm currently educating our staff on. And so using Father God language is not helpful for a child who's experienced abuse by a father, right? So how can we make sure that in all these different areas we're caring for the kids and being informed in the ways that um, we can bring them healing? Thank you. Yeah, Jerry. Is this, um, you said 18 months, is this like a, a transitional, um, I guess my analogy would be a hospital. Mm -hmm. they, they really need a lot of care, mm -hmm. but they're not going to live in the hospital forever. Uh, what, what kind of term, or what age do, do you take, and do they age out, and where do they go from? From the home. Yeah, can you give like a, just a general overview yeah. of kind of what the what the home and the program are like? So, since we were founded in 1908 as an orphanage, um, most folks uh, attribute orphanage as in staying in one place. And now it's, uh, and Madeline's going to talk a little bit about what today's orphans look like, but uh, it is less about, you know, they, they used to stay with us until they went to the military, got married, uh, went to the workforce, whatever it was. Now it is a, um, we are a temporary treatment facility, and so um, they, there are some, you know, we, in our residential program, we serve children ages 6 to 17. Legally, um, when they turn 18, they are no longer a minor, so they can't be what we call on campus anymore. Uh, we have some things available afterward. There is our um, independent living cottage that is on our property, literally across the street, but we call it off campus because it's not behind the gates. 
Um, so that is a, an aging out process. But as Madeline mentioned, you know, 18 to 24 months, that's a short time. So there are some that will age out, but a lot of them, um, you know, we have an independent living program that starts working with them early, uh, around 13, so that whether they're going to stay through, they age out at 18 or they get discharged at 14, they've gotten some skills they need to transition out. So part of the, um, and, and I'm hearing from your question about what determines them um, either staying through and aging out or transitioning out, part of that could be from their referral source. So if they're state placed and they have some other, uh, whether it's a, a smaller foster home that works better for them or they find a relative or if they're not state placed and uh, mom or dad gets things back together and they're able to be reunified, because um, as, as Madeline mentioned, there is a treatment plan that they are working. So there is an end goal and the kids are a part of that, their family's a part of that. So a lot of those factors lead to what the next step is. Cool, we'll get into that in more detail as well. So if you've got questions in the next couple of weeks, we can get into that more specifically with what they share. A couple more. Anything else that you guys are really curious about or you want to kind of get into? Yeah, Karen. Are they from all over Florida or central Florida, the children? Largely from Central Florida, but they do come from all over. And we do have two campuses. So the one in Enterprise is our main campus. And then we have a North Florida campus in Madison, which is just uh, east of Tallahassee. Um, and so they pull from some of the northern regions of Florida. Um, but largely, you'll find they're Central Florida. But every once in a while, we get some from down south. I had no idea. I just learned something. <laughs> Second campus. Oh, yeah. Good to know. Dave. Do they get a chance, uh, while kids are there, do they get any chance to integrate with other kids outside of the home to help them know what life's going to look like rather than just being in grown, I guess? So <laughs> I'll, I'll take this. <laughs> well, you work directly, so I think that's No, good. yeah, so um, we've, it's looked differently. Um, recently, the most, so we have a, a school on campus, too. Um, and we've, we've made the move this year to have all of our residents come on campus except for a handful, um, one who needs um, some special education because he's on the autism spectrum, things like that. Um, but we made that move to bring them on campus because our on-campus school it has emotional intelligence um, as part of it. And so we're teaching kids how to manage the emotions that they're experiencing because of their trauma and abuse. So a lot of our keeping them on campus for at least the parts of the time is intentional because you know it's the hub and we can really um, wrap around them. But we do um, provide opportunities on the weekends. They have rec funds where they go off and do like go to the movies and go to the skating rink and go do very normal things. Um, and then we also are always looking for opportunities and this is something we can get into later with youth groups like oftentimes pair up with us. We've had multiple youth choirs come through and do performances. We've had youth groups come and just do game nights with us and all that kind of thing or we've gone off campus to local churches and done activities there. So we're always looking for ways to provide and that's what we call normalcy. Um, um, to provide opportunities that are normal, as normal as normal can look um, when you're living in a group home. Um, but yes, we do find opportunities for them to engage outside of our campus when possible. I think that part of that relates to your question earlier about the wounds. Um, mm -hmm. In the midst of doing some of that trauma-informed care, uh, I think one of the best things we can do is also name the fact that we understand this is not uh, what you might expect as normal, or this is not home for you. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the, the best things we can offer a child right away is to say, you know, we're not pretending that everything's fine and see, right. we have all this great stuff. They're also dealing with a loss of a relationship, a loss of trust, a loss of their understanding of God or whatever it is. And so if we can name the fact, I think it comes back to your normalcy question of giving them a chance to be a kid and go out and go to the beach, go into town, go, you know, just as, as we wanted to be away from our parents, they also want that. And so how can we do that while also keeping them safe? And um, so I think that helps with the uh, process of helping to heal those wounds. And when they're out of our care, they can remember what it feels like to be empowered and loved and spoken to like uh, a free thinking individual rather than having all their decisions made for them. Great question. So I'm going to cut it off here for the sake of time. Um, Ryan has left a couple of like pamphlets and brochures back there. I also want to encourage you, uh, or if you're watching online or catching up on this later in the week, any questions you have or stuff you want more info on, um, email info at wearecollectivechurch.com. If we'll collect those questions and I'll forward them uh, to Madeline and Ryan, and hopefully we can fold that stuff in. Um, we also will we'll still meet for Occupy this week. I'm not sure if you can make it, but we crowdsource sermon content Tuesday afternoons at 4. 
okay. at Trilogy. Right. Um, if you can make it great, if not, we'll at least kick around questions and we'll send some thoughts to Madeline to, to help shape kind of what she's gonna share next week. Um, but yeah, keep that stuff coming in. Um, and if you guys can stick around for a few minutes after and you guys wanna meet them and introduce yourselves, if you have questions, then they can help kind of collect that stuff as well. Um, how about giving them a hand and then we'll see them again in the next few weeks. Thank you guys. Um, and just to also give you some, some cool stuff to look forward to, um, I believe if we can make it work, the plan is actually to have the youth band from uh, the, the chapel at the children's home um, here to do music, not next Sunday, but the following Sunday. And the kid, a lot of the kids are gonna actually be here with you guys. So um, that'll be our intergenerational Sunday. So we'll actually have a bunch of kids from the children's home here um, with uh, our kids and our students. So that should be really neat. Um, thank you guys very much. That was great. Uh, so, um, part of how we shape ourselves, we've sort of asked all these questions about how we form, uh, how we form this, um, not just the impulse, but the practice for hospitality, not just individually, but as a, as a community, part of how we shape ourselves around this, this posture, um, hospitality that's not just convenient, but, uh, essential, um, not always life or death, but sometimes life or death. Part of how we shape uh, this hospitality that makes room for the orphan, that makes room for those without a tribe, for those without a family, is that we, every week, come to this table, to this open table that's gathered around unconditional welcome. It's gathered around radical hospitality, that's gathered around self-giving love. Um, we gather around a meal that symbolizes a body given, Not pre-cut, but given. And bloodshed. And part of what we do uh, when we rehearse this meal, we imagine, we enact a tribe and a family larger than the body of our family. So you think nuclear family, bigger than that. Um, you think the tribe that's represented by this room or even all the people that might be online at any point, bigger than that, beyond uh, the family of blood, beyond legal relationship, so that we can remember, so that we can be reminded and remind ourselves and one another of the way that Jesus invites us to live, uh, how we include, who we welcome, um, because we think this is the most generous and open and life-giving way that we can be. And so as always, the table of this tribe for all the other tribes and those without a tribe, this table for all families and those without a family, this is the same table that is set for us tonight, but as always, this table is open to all people. So no one will ever be turned away. If you'd like, feel free to come and grab a piece of bread and dip it in the cup. 